Hi, Dr. Riley. Hello, David. Welcome. If I'm missing some people, I don't have Ben right now. I don't have Katie. Oh, Yannick, I have you, but you know you're more absent right now? Yeah. practice and I didn't get it like at all but when I did the other one I was able to understand it okay good good good, good. what I'm going to do let's go and we'll have people talk about the um the practice number the review number two which was like the review number one and then once we know that we're solid on that then we'll go and talk about the other additional review that is a little bit more of a stretch, but know that your quiz will be more similar to the review one and review two, the ones that have the answers on the back and the ones that give you a stepwise progression as to how to fill in your answers, okay? So that's what I'd like to do now. So um, you should have posted that second review, the review number two. So hopefully you did that. But so let's do this. I have the groups that we had. So why, and I had five groups and we have four problems. So why don't we all focus on this review number two and let me go around and ask people for components of this. Okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll put, well, let me see, why don't I see, go to security. Let me see if people are able to present anything. So of our first group, uh, David and Mason and Wyatt, do any of you have an iPad that you can project the first problem onto? So, Questions being asked of David, Mason, and White. I need an answer from one. I'm still two. in that same laptop I was, so I don't got it. I don't got the um, the ability to share it because I don't got the Google Drive on my laptop. Mason, what about you? You have the I'm iPad. using a I'm using a different iPad for Zoom, but I might be able to like send a copy to this iPad and do that. Okay, and so and then David, what about you? I'm on my laptop. So um, you get the big picture that everyone being on the laptop and not using the school iPad at all, you know, have they died at this point or what is the story? Because it's hard to get any kind of sharing going when I'm the only one that can really share. That gets really boring. And I, I get the sense of losing people because it's just me droning on and on. So what, what happened to the school, the school iPad? 
Thomas, what happens if you like it? It's easier to take notes while go, like watching you on Zoom through your computer because you can use notability on your iPad like fully then. Is it on your iPad and your Zoom and just split screen it? Um, and notability becomes like a really small square you have to write into, whereas if you have the Zoom on your computer, you can just watch it on a bigger screen and have notability completely open and for you. But, but can't you still, like, say, if you want to share the iPad, can't you just log on to the Zoom with your iPad then just for that little hour window? Yeah, you can. I'll, I'll move to Yeah. So, so, you know, I'm all about taking, taking good productive notes. But when we need to share, if you could log on with your iPad just for those few minutes and then log off again, that would be the best way to do it. So, in lieu of that, um, I will put mine up and then I'll have. People talk about mine, which I think I, I have it done on paper. I don't know if I can have it done in here. But we'll see. I think I got it so I can share my first question if you'd rather that. And that would be so awesome. So see if you can put it up. Can you see that? Well, yes, yeah. That's All right. right. You guys see it too? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so go ahead. So, um, I'm gonna have so Mason. I'm gonna have you keep yours up if you don't mind. Yeah, that's fine. Discussion. But then what we'll do is we'll go around to other people to see what pieces of it they've understood or have questions about. Okay. Okay. Cool. okay so Mason, start us off. How did you distinguish between the objective function and the constraint? Um, well, they're asking to minimize the cost. So I knew the objective function would be about cost. And so I got that to be C equals 11X plus 8Y. And then okay. it says um, with an area of 100 square feet, so that I'm, I know that X times Y is going to equal 100. And then so I get the new function of C equals um, 11x plus 800 over x. Okay, good. Okay, so stop there for a second. So those of you at home, or excuse me, those of you not Mason, uh, your setup could be a little bit different depending on what you call x and y. You should have the same coefficients, however, because I labeled house and road. So you should have a five by the house piece and a six by the road and then four on the vertical section. Then the question is, do you have X and Y? So look at that, make sure that you have all those pieces correct, even though they might be different variables than what Mason has. And the second thing that could be different is you can decide whether you want to switch out the Y or the X. At the end of the problem, you will have the same answer, but your objective function in one variable and your first derivative and second derivative will be different. And your CV, might be the other uh, variable, the y, in this case. So you're always going to have those differences. So don't let that stuff throw you. But you should end up with the same total cost of fencing. You might have different components, depending on how you define things. Total cost should match, and your dimensions should match. OK, we left Ben coming back again. OK, so. On to um, Wyatt. Wyatt, could you walk us through using Mason's um, visual here, the first and second derivative, and the uh, finding the CD, and then getting your sign charts? Okay, so um, the first derivative, you're just going to do the 11x turns into 11, and then 8 times 100 over x is going to end up being. Um, negative 800 over x squared um because you're gonna do the uh you're gonna minus one from the x in the denominator or like you're gonna take it down um an exponent which is gonna make it x squared um and you're gonna put that in the denominator because it's negative and you're gonna do the eight times a hundred um, and since the X, uh, is in the denominator, you're going to make it negative 800 over X squared. Okay. And then, 
Yeah. What's that? Good. That's good. Oh, okay. And then, um, so when you're taking the second derivative, the 11 is going to just go away. And then, um, you're going to do the, um, negative 800 times two, or I guess times negative two, which is going to make it positive 600. And then the X squared is going to become X to the third. And then, yeah. what's that? Let me just stop you for one second because there's another good insight. When you get that second derivative, because you have a geometric feature, you know your x has to always be positive. Since you know that, what do you know now your second derivative will always be? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, that means it's going to be concave up. So I know I am minimizing cost. When you get to that second derivative, it should be an affirmation of what you were going for. Even before you do the test, you should be able to say, oh, yeah, I see that that second derivative is always positive, which is a good thing, because that is a concave up function. Then. Okay, so go ahead. And then I can't really remember, but the CV, you said, oh, oh, you set the first derivative equal to zero, correct? Correct. And that's and true, then, but definitely in your memory bank. And then, um, so you're going to uh, set the first derivative equal to zero. So then you'd um, multiply the x squared over to the other side. Oh, wait. Um, no, you're going to write it as zero is equal to 11 uh, plus 800x to the negative second. And then I think you subtract the 11, then divide by it. So wait, right. hold on. So look at his first derivative. The way it's set up, you see how he has the x squared, not x to the negative second? Yeah. For evaluating it. You Should want you just write it like that and then multiply by x to the second? What you end up doing is say 11 equals 800 over x squared. Do cross products. x squared times 11 equals 800. 800 divided by 11 equals x squared. So technically you get plus and minus 8.5. But because it's a geometric feature, it has to be positive, and therefore you only select the positive 8.5. Gotcha. Okay, so when you, when you start trying to figure out what your CV is, do not try to work with a negative exponent. It will really confuse you. Okay. You get into a positive exponent before you try to evaluate. Okay? And then that mm -hmm. will be much better. Okay, so you want to say a couple words about the second derivative test? Um, is instance is positive, it's concave up. So it's the second derivative test that he's testing right on top of the critical value. And you take that 8.5, put it in your second derivative, and it's positive, and like Wyatt just said, it's concave up. So then look at his statement. What's important to include Wyatt in your statement? Um, What's that? You have to have two important words in it. Um, since it's um, the second derivative is concave up, it's the minimum. Right, so you have to say what the concavity is, and then you have to have a conclusion. It's a minimum. Perfect. Okay, let's move over to David. David, you're on this team too. So David, um, we have 8.5 feet my critical value. How do you get the other dimension? The, how do you get the other dimension? Well, I need to know where 11.8 come from. How did I get it? Oh. <laughs> um, so we have 8.5 feet. Right, that's, that's your critical value. So my question is, where does the 11.8 come from? How did I get it? Did we, did we plug in 8.5? Where? Uh, in the original equation. Got two equations. I've got an objective function and a constraint. Yeah. So where did you plug it into? Dx. True. Into the objective. Function in one variable. Nope. No. 
Because you don't have to do what the cost is. You're going to have to oh, run out. Cool. Gotcha. So, so then again, where else could you plug 8.5 into? The constraint. Perfect. That's where it goes because you have two values. You've got 100 and you have the um, 5. Therefore, you can solve for the missing y. Okay, so that's a huge point. Get your other variables plugged the one that you got, the CV, into your constraints every single time. Okay? Okay, David, so put that to your memory. So doing that, you get a level point eight. Tell me, how do we figure out the cost of the fencing parallel to the road? Okay, I'm still, still with you, honey. Oh, you're still with me? Yeah. What's the question? Know how I got my fencing parallel to the road. How do you get your fencing parallel to the road? Um, cost of the fencing parallel to the road would be the same length, and you would just look at his figure. His diagram has it for you. Before it says road, and figure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Cost of the road. See how it says um six x. So your x but the x was the critical value, the fencing closest to the road is six times what? 11.8. Oh, that's the y. Oh, uh, then 8.5. I'm just so. Yes, yeah, so six times 8.5. That's exactly it. How about the fencing parallel to the house? It would, it would be the same. It would be 8.5 times 5x instead. And so to get the total, take those two values, and you also need to say 8 times the 11.8. And when you add all four of those things together, you should be getting 187.90. Yeah. And so David, how do you feel about that problem? Oh, David. I'm here. Sorry. What happened? <laughs> about that problem. Put a quiz saying next class, something like that. Could you do it? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Well, then you have to work it out between now and then, right? So, be focused on the last question. So, I would take a screenshot of this if you don't have this um, on your paper. Because this That's is what cool. you know. All right. Okay. How about the rest of you? Anybody have comments? I have a question. So yeah. I got like a few different numbers. So I got like one eighty-seven point six for cost of fencing. Would that be okay? You're probably gonna be okay. Did you solve for your um, the bigger number first? Uh, uh yes. When did you get first? Eleven point seven three. Yeah, that's the difference. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So what Gavin's saying, he solved for the, the what the y value is and got eleven point seven three. So that may change the total cost of fencing a little bit, but you should be about in the same ballpark. Okay, if you have like $300 for the cost of fencing, something is wrong. Okay, so just um, you know, discern that carefully. But because of the rounding, it's gonna be slightly different answers if you solve for the larger side first. Okay, anything Dr. else? Dr. Riley, yeah. Um, so would it matter, like, this is what Gavin was talking about. Would it matter if, um, so for the, the CV, I got 8.5, but it was actually like 8.52 or something when it was rounded. Uh, when you uh, plug it back in, do you plug back in the original into the constraint or the rounded into the constraint? So I would say, I'm going to say round the lenses to the nearest 10th. I would consider finding the, the CV taking the lenses that are the nearest 10th. Okay, so that's what I would do. Okay. So you can take the I can put it back into the constraint. Okay? Because that's considered okay. a value. You've, you've done all this work to get to the CV. That's a terminal value. Round that to the nearest tenth. Then use that to figure out the rest of uh, the problems. Okay, does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Good. Okay. 
Trace, how are you doing? I think I'm doing okay, pretty well. All right, and Ben, what do you think? I'm following. Okay, Sophia? Um, I mean, I understand the concept, but I was like confused at first because I was like, what worksheet is this? And I realized I did the additional practice instead of this. Okay. So. Okay. But can you, were you able to follow along with what, what Mason had? Yeah, I understand. Okay, so you were probably working on this piece in class when you were here last time, I think. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. we did. Okay, all right. So let's let's go on to the next one. Doctor um, Ryan. Yes. Can you can you just explain how you got um like where the number one hundred came? Yes, that was a given. Oh wait, never mind, never mind. I see it in the in the, in the question. I'm bugging. And the, uh, but that's a good question, Trace, because what's going to happen is this. When you have a constraint, they have to give you a value. So you're going to have the area equals to 100, and then you'll have just the two variables. The objective function, you don't have a cost. You're going to try to solve for that in an optimal way. So the fact that you see you have 100 square feet, that has an area of that, that's kind of a tip off that that's going to be your constraint. Okay, having a hundred there is a good insight into what uh, what role that information is going to take, and that's going to be your constraint. And then you're going to build the objective function from there. And it may be a good idea to read this little paragraph a couple of times to make sure that you have set up all the problem correctly. Because really, once you have this label, and then you have the constraint and the objective function, the rest is just the math operation. But if you have um, made an error here, say if you if you multiply the fours together and got 16y, it's going to mess you up. So definitely take the time to make sure that when you do your diagram, it actually matches the information in the paragraph. Because that is very easy to go through this quickly, and then that sets you up for a more difficult job down here. Okay, so you just want to be careful. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's, um, so Ben, Jordan, and Sheldon. Do any of you have, and thank you, Mason, for doing that. That was huge. Do any of you no have problem. that we could possibly see the second problem on? So that would be Ben, Jordan, or Sheldon. I do not have uh, two filled out. So do you think you can put yours up, Ben? I don't have it filled out, but I can put it. I can put my iPad up. I can probably share my screen, but it's not filled out. Okay, so put it up, and then we'll we'll try it. I'll call people to help us fill it in. Okay. Yeah. I have, I'm going to pull on um, Heather and Jonathan as well. So Katie's still not here. So I'm going to have the four or the five of you guys <coughs> contribute. Okay, we have a nice. We will have. Yeah, we have a nice blank screen. Okay, so the first thing you want to do, go ahead and put a rectangle um, someplace in there so that we can illustrate our. Okay, good. That's, that's a rectangle kind of advisably, but that's okay. You, know, you have that nice little straight line feature, um, but. Now it's a great thing. There you go. Oh, there you go. Good, 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 good. Simply done. Okay, so then let's let's start reading. So I'm gonna read and I'm gonna call on people to tell me what this means. So 800 is available to fence a rectangular exercise course that is to be built in a local park. Okay, so given that, um, Sheldon, what do you think the 800 is gonna be? The 800, that's going to be the constraint. I think so too. Okay, so if you can, Ben, if you could just write so far 800 equals, and then we'll figure out the rest. Okay, so then the next sentence says if the fencing on the side of the exercise area parallel to the road costs 
ten dollars per foot. So what you want to do now is label one of the sections road. Good. And then you can put a 10 there. And why don't we make those the X's? Let's put an X there. We'll put an X on top and put Y the other two places. Fencing for the remaining three sides costs eight dollars per foot. And here comes my superlative word: maximize the area of this exercise course. So, um, the George Terry promised with his mic. So let me go over to Heather. So Heather, if you if the area, what are you going to write down for your objective function so far? Um, I did x times y equals a. Yeah, so have so go a equals x times y. Yeah. So go ahead, um, Ben. If you can write on the objective function line, a equals x times y. Ben. Ah, uh, so can you repeat that? Yeah, for the objective function, as I just said. Write A equals X times Y. Okay, so now we're going to build our next piece. So, Jonathan, are you able to build our constraint for us? Yeah, so then the constraint would be um, 800 equals 18X plus 16Y. Okay, so, so is everyone in the audience good with that? That's perfect. All right, so now our job is to switch out, and I'm going to have us replace the Y, because life will be happier if we do. So, so what we, how will we do that? So if I want to replace the Y, then how would I do it? Um, so that it's, it's um, a Y equals expression. Oops. Subtract 18x. Okay, and what is the reason why I want you to go that way is because you end up getting y equal to, ready for me, Ben? 80 to yeah. by 16 is nicely 50. So that's going to be y equals 50 minus, and then it will be 9 8 x, 9 over 8 times x. Okay, so that, that works out really nicely because you have whole numbers except for the 9 8, but at least the 50 is nice. Okay, so now I want Ben to build his objective function in one variable. So, Heather, what will that be? Area equal. Um, area equals x, and then in parentheses, 800 minus 16x, and then over x. So I'm gonna, I want to use 50 minus 9 8 x. So, sorry. Yeah, she's seeing over 8 x. So I'm going to use 50 minus 9 8 x. Okay, see how we made it simpler so that y equals 50 minus 9 8 x? So let's use that for y. So then the area is going to equal x times that. So then you can write area equals 50x minus 9, 8x squared. Uh, can you repeat what it was after your 50x? Uh, yeah, 50x minus 9 over 8 times x squared. Okay, is everyone okay with that? That's going to be my objective function in one variable. David, how are you? David, are you following along? Are you talking to me? Uh, no, sorry, Maisie, but how are you doing? Um, I'm doing good, sorry. Okay, I was trying to grab David, but David is not hearing me. David. No, I'm here. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm following along. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's take the first derivative. Okay, so let's hop over. I'm gonna hop over to Victor. Victor, given that Ben has written this down as the area, what's your first derivative gonna be? Um, wouldn't it be negative uh, 18 over 8x uh, plus 50? Um, okay, we can go with that. Okay, well, what do we do in order here? So what we can do is, why don't you say a prime equals 50 minus 18 over 8 times x? I yeah, just changed your order, Victor, just to follow from the other one, okay? Yeah. That was fine. It was a good answer. Okay, so that's I just usually like putting the X before. Yeah, that, then that's fine. Okay, so let's get the second derivative. So what do we have for that trace? What would you get for a second derivative if this is the form of the first derivative? Um, a and I then like yeah, a double prime equals um, 18 over x squared. No, just taking this derivative, look at the first derivative. So 50, that derivative is zero, right? What's the derivative of negative 18 over 8 times x? Is it just negative 18 over 8? Yes. And you lost, drop that 50. Because the 50 doesn't have an X. Right, okay. yep. Beautiful. So it's gonna just equal negative 18 over eight. So what do I know right away? That is independent of X. No matter what happens from this point forward, the second derivative is gonna be negative. That means the function is gonna be concave down, which means that I am maximizing my area, which is a good thing. Okay, um, why? Why? How do I get to CB? You take the derivative, or you take the, or you take the first derivative and set it for a... Second equal to? Zero. You, you remember right. that. Awesome. Okay, so I think I got 22.2. That's going to be your CB. So that's your x equals. So, Ben, write down x equals just so we know which variable it is. Okay, so that's good. Okay, so people in the room, we're going to have video. That's okay. They'll be able to hear you. Okay, so Gavin, how did, so they have to go, they have to do a first derivative chart. So tell Ben what he should be writing. Or right, you want to make your line and you want to put your critical value on the line. So you can put the line at the critical value 22.2. Ben, can you hear um, Gavin? Barely, but yes, I can hear him. Yeah, okay, you, so, go ahead. And then you want to take a value to the left and plug it into the first derivative, see what that gives you, and then a value to the right. Do the same. Okay, so if you do that, and usually, Ben, we put the 22.2 below, so just pop that below the line. But then what, what Gavin said to do is take that 22.2, take a number to the left. So let's just pick one. If you plug in one in your first derivative, will you get a positive number or a negative number, Ben? Um, positive. Yes, so put, put a plus on that line to the left of the hash mark. Perfect. Then if you plug in 100 into the first derivative, do you get a positive number or a negative number? Negative. Okay, so we need an explanation of the first derivative. So Maisie, coming, coming to you. So Maisie, what are we gonna write for the first derivative explanation? Um, so I said at the critical value 22.2, the slope changes from positive to negative, which means it's a max. Beautiful. Okay, so the words I heard that made me so happy are the words slope and the conclusion of the max. So at the critical value, the slope changes. How would you write that down? Oh, that's what I'm trying to say to you. So at the critical value of 
images. You see the word slope. So put above above changes, put well right here. Look, look there. Slope changes from positive. Negative. Good. Therefore, we have a mass. Mm. Okay, good. Okay, so Miles coming at you. So how did you get the other variable, the y? What would you do with the 22.2? So so if you look back at the constraint, you basically already created a y equation. So I is like a, yeah, so you so that the y equals 50, i is um, 9 over 8 to the x. So you plug in your x there, and then that's going to get you your y value. What did you get? So I, yeah, 25. Yeah, me too. So doing that, we got a 25. Okay, so your dimensions of the enclosed epicycle core are going to be 22.2 times 25, and they're both feet. Okay, so then uh, let's see who we have in. Uh, Jordan, have you figured out your mic situation? Yes. Okay, so let's figure out what we have in terms of the cost of the fencing parallel to the road. So David, come back and let's do fencing parallel to the road. Okay, so we need to see the road is 10x and our x and y are there. What are you going to say to figure out the cost of fencing parallel to the road, David? Uh, you would do 22.2 times 10, right? That's it, perfect. So that's going to be 222, Ben. So then go around and plug in all the other values, and you should end up getting, I got a total cost of fencing of $799.60. So that was 799.60. And I was happy with that because of the rounding of the 22.2. That's why it's slightly less than the 800 that was available, but it does round to 800, so I thought I was good there. Okay, so that's the second big problem. So how, how are we on that? So then, I know you were the scribe, but did, were you able to follow along? Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. That was great. Okay, so we've got two more to do, and I have two more teams. So um, maybe Olivia and, and Victor, do any of you have an iPad that you can put up? I'm not on my computer right now, but if you want, I can log off. I think that is a no. Let me see if I can get mine up. I think I can do it if you need me to. Okay, that'd be great, Victor. Let's see if you can get three up, and we'll make sure that we understand that. So for, for number three, that should have been the one that you found the easiest. Because for number three, you only have one equation to work with. And that's how we started this whole process. Just having one equation. So that should have been very comfortable. Okay, so you want to just walk us through. So you like that. My only suggestion would be, Victor, for a first derivative, why don't you have that be either f prime of x or y prime so that you have an actual equation there? I know that I wrote the word first derivative, but it's always good to have a y value there. So you might just walk us through what you did because it all looks great. Except for one little thing. Because I think you just stopped writing. Okay, so yeah, that? sorry. I had to go off mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, so for the first part, I just... I just took the first derivative of 4x squared plus 32x plus 20. And from that, I got 8x plus 32. And then I set that equal to zero, which got um, 8x equals negative 32, which makes the critical value negative four. And then for the second derivative, I just took the derivative of 8x plus 32, and I got eight. Good. Did I tell um, you right? 
that second derivative has to always be positive so that you know it's a minimum, right? Yeah. What's nice about taking take the second derivative right away? All right, go ahead. So since the critical value was four, I put that on the sign chart and I plugged in um, a value lower and higher than negative four. And I got a change from negative slope to positive slope, which would indicate a minimum. And to the right is the explanation of my derivative test. And I just kind of explained how this slope changes from negative to positive. And the critical value was four. And then that uh, sign chart indicates that the minimum value of the function was four. I think the minimum value is negative 44. Oh, negative 44? I think that's what I got. Oh, yeah, because I had to plug it in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, so, so plug it in. So what, what that is, that's if you evaluate the original function at negative 4, you should be getting negative 44. Okay, and you yeah. notice how um, Victor's first derivative test has the word slope and the, and the conclusion as a minimum. So that's what I look for. The other thing, people had some, some complications with that sign chart because when they pick a number less than negative four or to the right of negative four, you can't pick zero. You've got to pick like negative 10. So be careful when your critical value is a negative. Sometimes you don't think about that clearly and you could end up getting two positives and then basically you have a shelf. Okay, so just pick numbers carefully when you have a negative critical value. Okay, so all that's beautiful. Anybody have any questions for Victor about anything he did? That's good. Victor, would you mind just showing us the next one and I'll have somebody else talk about it since you have the number? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So Sophia. I should probably go off mute because that might interfere with like some of the uh like some of the other people talking. So I'm gonna switch real quick to the Zoom. Okay, that's not good. So Sophia, I'm gonna come over to you and okay. we'll Oh, and I'll have you guys tag team it. So, Sophia, do you want to start? Yeah, so since it says um, the product is 400, I'll, I would start off by um, putting the constraint as 400 equals x times y. Right. And then I would um, isolate probably the y. So I would make it y equals 400 divided by x. Yep. Um, and then... Uh, for the objective function, I'd probably just put s equals x plus y. Yeah, x plus y. So I have one comment. Okay, for the constraints, you actually have a second set of constraints because they ask you for two positive numbers. So in addition to the constraint you're actually using, you want to have the other one in the back of your mind so that you don't pick a negative number. So your, your other constraint would be that both x and y are going to be greater than zero. And that just okay. have because uh, if you end up getting two values, you want to be able to eliminate one of them and not be testing things that really are not germane to your solution. Okay, good. It tells about the uh, objective function in one variable. Um. So that would just be putting plugging the constraint into the objective function. So s equals x plus 400 divided by x. Yeah, so, I think, so Victor, I think you want to add a plus x there. Okay, so that's what you want to do. And then what you do is you have to find the other one that you're interested in. Yeah. So that's good. So well done, Sophia. Olivia, could you do the first derivative and tell um, tell Victor what the correction is? Um. Okay. So for the first derivative, it would become negative four hundred x over um ne next to the negative two plus one. And then you'd make that equal zero, which would factor out to x equaling 20. And then you can do your um, like sign chart. And I plugged in for zero, which would give a negative answer. Or I plugged in for one, actually, which would give a negative answer. And then I plugged in for 40, which would give a positive answer. Therefore, it would be a minimum. 
Okay, so I think I need to have uh, Victor describe a couple of things underneath your second derivative. Because you didn't have the one, you initially need to say negative 400 over x squared. Actually, it's the positive 400 over x squared equals one to get rid of the negative. Good. So that equals one. So then technically, x squared equals 400, and x technically will equal plus and minus 20. But because you had that secondary constraint of your variables having to be greater than zero, you immediately eliminate the negative 20 and only use the positive 20 on the side chart. Okay, good. Okay, so to reinforce one thing, everything is good, the explanation is good, you've got the slope and you have the conclusion. And then, um, Olivia, we had the 20 for the x. Uh, tell everybody how you get the y then. Where do you plug that x into? You plug the y into the original function. Right. So which function? I've got two of them. Um, you'd plug it in into the... Um, like the one you created with like the objective. So you, you, you plug it into the constraint because there you only would have one missing value. So plug it into the constraint. That gives you the y is 20. Then be really careful because to get your objective function's answer, that's an addition. It's very easy to multiply those two together and get 400, but you want the sum. So that would be 40. Okay, so that's all good. So what do you think? This is the kind of assessment I want you to be able to be successful on. You've gone through all four problems. So you've seen all the different types. And I think you can be very successful if you can be very, very much focused on, you know, the detail of it. Okay, anybody have any questions on these four? So well done for getting the, uh, the visuals. That was great. Yeah, Dr. Riley. Jonathan. Yeah, so this might be inconsequential, but uh, so I know how you said that the two positive numbers, X and Y, is like a, a secondary constraint. So would you want us to write that down like on, next to the X times Y equals 400, which is like the main constraint? So like X is greater than zero and then Y is greater than zero? Idea in terms of your uh, method, because when you get down below, if you go on autopilot, you're going to be testing both of those values. And you shouldn't even be speaking about the, the negative. So yeah, I would, I would do it. You're not going to use that constraint to help you get the objective function in one variable, but it will eliminate one of the critical values that you actually get. So yeah, that's a good point. So I would write something about that just so your focus on the fact that your number has to be a positive. Because unlike the previous case, you don't have a geometric feature that makes things positive. You have to figure out can you can you justify it by the excellence by the requirements of the problem and that's why it's positive okay so would, would you scroll down to, up to number three also so that trace can look at something it's all right i can't put my water yeah so victor just slide down if you can so that trace can see number three uh, victor oh victor I think he just got frozen. Okay, Victor, can you put up number three again by chance? Yeah, I could. Okay, so hang on a second, Trace. Okay, so where are you looking, Trace? Um, I was looking at the explanation of the first derivative test. Okay, so key words are up by the slope and then make a conclusion. Is it a minimum or a maximum? Um, minimum. Both of the two features you want to have. You want to have the word slope in there and you want to have a conclusion. Second derivative test, you want to have the word concavity and you want to have a conclusion. Okay, well, I think, hopefully you found this helpful exercise. But now we've gone through all of these. So the other assignment we had was the extra, the uh, additional practice. That is good also, 
And I was thinking that what we could do is we could just get back into groups and do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you work on that other piece now. Then your homework is just going to be to study the, uh, the uh, regular reviews number one and number two. Okay, don't worry so much about um, problems two and three on the additional review. I'd like you to try them because we're going to get to this topic and this application a little bit. The first problem on the additional review is in keeping with what we're doing right now. That is something that you should be able to do. You have a fencing situation. You have to draw your own picture. I didn't write out what you're going to do, so you have to think about how you set things up and how we set things up on these previous examples. So let me all have Victor stop sharing. Thank you, Victor. That was terrific. And uh, what we'll do is I'm going to put you in groups for a little bit. See if you can get at least the first problem done. And I will call you back in about 10 minutes. And then we'll talk about briefly about the other two problems. Okay. So that's my plan right now. Let me just do the breakout rooms. It'll probably be different than last time because I have different people here. Okay, so I've got two or three of you for a breakout room. And um, so let's see. So I'm going to say create. So go ahead and you can pick your room in just a second. I'm just going to uh, put it up for 10 minutes. Okay, so for 10 minutes, go ahead and talk about the first problem in the 2.5 additional review. So, Miles, did you get to, to this one too? Oh um, no, I didn't do the additional review because I didn't. There's so there's the days, there's the, there's the days assignment. Um, let me say that, and then there's the something that says do Thursday. Yeah, I, I think what I said was do one or the other. Um, but I said really do this one. So just when Gary comes back, you two can talk about this first one okay. because that's like the other. And then the other two are good, but I'm not going to quite go this far on the coming up quiz. So is the additional review due on Thursday or is it just Friday? This is just classwork. Okay, so I just want whatever you get done. So I want to have people just have time to go back over things and okay. not have to write out another document. So uh, Gavin, we're doing the additional review. Okay. So and we just if you and Miles want to just talk about the first problem, I put them in breakout rooms and they're gonna come back out in a minute. Okay. Again, you feel like you have a good yeah, I think so. I mean, the only the only thing I was really confused on before was like setting how to like set it up with the stuff. Yeah, I think I know. Yeah. Like for the first one, wouldn't the objective function be a equals x y and the restraint would be whatever the right? I mean, the they want you to maximize the area. Enclose the largest area. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's what It would just be 500 equals plus y, right? Because we don't have any numbers for x or y. Right, I just did 2y plus x because I made my, my vertical sections the y's. Oh, uh, one side of the enclosure, yes, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so that's
Okay, I've tripped myself up here. That's where I okay. So I had, yeah, I thought I had it. So I have the, so I solve for x, right? So I got x equals 250 over y. Did you solve for x? I did. So I got x equals 500 over 250. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I did wrong. I did over 2y because of minus yeah. 2y. Yep. Yeah. It's been a long day. <laughs> Wait, Dr. Brown, I'm getting 250 for Y, but I don't think that's possible. So did you make the Y the vertical section? Yes. So Y should be 125. Um, okay, so I had X equals 500 minus 2Y, right? So that's what, yeah. so you plug that into it's 500 minus 2Y times Y, right? Uh -huh. So you get 500Y minus 2Y squared. So then you would move the 2y over. So the 2y squared equals 500y. And you would divide by 2 and 1, right? Isn't your y prime, isn't your area prime 500 minus 4y? What did I get? I didn't. Take what do you have area? This is a little big. I got 31,000. The area. They didn't answer the question. They 
dimension for the area they wanted to dimension. Oh, so that is the 250 that I was done. Yes, okay. exactly. Ah. This guy's got about a minute and 23 seconds to come back. Yeah. Yeah. That's just it. Imagine it's 125 by Okay, so I have everyone back. So let me um, just show you this. So first up, how kind of back up? Were you able to just apply what we just did to this problem as well? Any issues that I should worry about? David, how are you? David? I'm alive. Alive is good. You're still riding that horse, I see. So, are you able to apply what we just did to this new problem? Uh, I, I tried, but I'm not sure. Okay, so I can ask. Try. Right. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is my setup. When I read it, I saw that the area had to, had to be the Lord is possible. That's my optimization. So area equals x times y. Then I'm going to build this against a house. So I have 500 feet of fencing, and I'm going to only need to fence three of the sides. So I made my vertical section y and my horizontal section x. So 500 equals 2y plus x. I wrote x equals 500 minus 2y and substituted x for x in the original optimization equation. So that brings me down to this. 
I then distributed got that to my objective function in one variable, took the first derivative, took the second derivative. The second derivative tells me I'm going to have a uh, the critical value will result in a maximum, which is good. That's what I'm looking for. Then I set the, the first derivative equal to zero. I get a critical value for y of 125 feet. I test either side of the critical value in the first derivative. If I, I plugged in a one, I got a positive number. I plugged in a 200, I got a negative number. So at the CV of 125, the slope changes from positive to negative, and therefore I have a max. Take your x, take your, take your y equals 125, and plug it back into this constraint equation to get your x value of 250. They ask for the dimensions, the dimensions that will maximize the area given the constraints of the fencing are going to be 125 feet by 250 feet. So how did, how did my work compare with what you were thinking? Dr. Riley. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, um, I did a second derivative test instead of a first derivative test, so would that also work? That's perfect. So let okay. me do that. So the second derivative test, I'm still testing my critical value is 125. And the other thing is your critical value could have been 250 if you were, if you were solving for x. So what uh, Matt is saying is when you take that second derivative, I notice right away it's negative no matter what the x is. So it's x independent. Second derivative tests are easier to do. So do them whatever you can. Then I would say at critical value of 125, um, I guess I'll say a prime prime of 125 is going to be less than zero, therefore it's concave down, which yields to a max. That match what you're saying, Jonathan? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so for this problem, I was silent as to what test you're going to do. Always do a test. If I'm silent to it, do the one that you want to do. I usually would just pick the second derivative test because it's just one quick thing, as opposed to testing um, on either side of the critical value. So just whatever test you do, make sure that you can write the correct correctly worded statement that goes along with it. Okay, so that's that's the problem type that you'll be doing on this quiz next class. Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is the next two problems just to get a sense of it. So I started writing out this one. And the key thing is here, we're gonna we're gonna do this material in the next section but it's very similar to what we're doing. You're asked to construct a lidded box. So that means you want to build kind of a cube. It's three-dimensional. The material used to build the top and bottom costs $10 a square foot. Okay, so the sides are at $10 each. It's $10 per square foot. Okay, that's an area measurement. The bottom is $10 per square foot, area measurement. They also told me the base length is three times the base width. So that's why I have three X here and X here, and my height is Y. If a box must have a volume of 50 cubic feet, there is your constraint. Volume equals length times width times height. Therefore, volume equals three X squared times Y. That has to equal 50. Okay? What are the dimensions that will minimize the cost? There's your optimization. What's my cost? My cost is $10 times the area of the bottom, which is length times width, which is 3x squared, plus another $10 times the area of the top, which is length times width, another 3x squared, plus you have four faces, right? So we have, let's see. You have two faces that are y times x, the front and the back of the box. So two x times y, 
at six dollars a square foot. Then you have these side panels here. I'll change my color. This one and the other back one back over here. That area is three x wide. So I have two of them at six dollars each. So it's six times two times three x wide. All these pieces can be combined to this. That is your objective function. Okay, it's not difficult, but you have to be patient with yourself to get the different areas. Okay, hold on. Let me stop share and reshare. Something happened. Well, good news here and bad news. The bad news is I only have to share the screen again because it's not letting me do that. Let me just try one more time. Nope. All right, so I'm just gonna talk. I'll talk you through a little bit. So that basically, once you get to the cost equals 60x squared plus 48xy, you are now ready to use your constraint to, to get rid of the y. So I substituted 50 over 3x squared for my y, and then everything else beyond that is the same as what we've done. Okay, so that's number two. So number three, let me tell you what the answers are so that uh, actually, I, I give you the answers at the very bottom of the next page. Yeah, so you have all your answers. So number three is a, cylinder can, a cylindrical can, and you need to make a cylindrical can that will hold 1.5 or 1,500 centimeters of liquid. So it has to hold that. That's, that's going to be the volume. Volume is 1,500 centimeters cubed. Volume equals pi r squared. That's the area of the bottom of the can times your height. Okay, they want to figure out, determine the dimensions of the can that will minimize the amount of material used. The amount of material used is the surface area. Your surface area is a circle on top, a circle on the bottom. So that's two pi r squared, and then the whole center of the can, the surface area is going to be the circumference times the height, so it's going to be 2 pi r times height. So those are the foundational pieces. So I'm going to try one more time to see if it will let me share. Dr. Riley? Yeah. So this kind of stuff is going to be on the quiz too? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's why I'm not that worried about. Okay, so I don't have a great grip on this stuff. Oh, I can share it again. Okay, so it's going to let me share again. Oh, oh yes, it did. Okay, so anyway, if you write this down for that one piece, then my y goes here. Okay, so problem number two and three are not going to be assessed on the quiz, but I want to be able to have you see the setup. And then for this, for this last one, this is what's going on. Volume equals volume of any shape is going to be the area of the, bit, of the bottom of it times the height. Okay, and this is the surface area. So you need those two components to be able to do this. Okay, so your homework was just, is just going to be to go through reviews one and two. The one that we started out the class with today, the one we did the last class. Those two reviews, if you can do those pieces, you're good. This first problem on the additional review is also good to understand. The other two problems are interesting and they're nice to do and we'll do more with them. But you don't need to worry about them, nor do I need you to submit them. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Don't forget, just because you have no written homework, it, it would be a mistake not to go back over those two documents. Okay, so I'm counting on you to just go back over them. And when you come in, 
Um, I'll quickly say if there are any issues, but then I like to just start off the quiz, okay? All right, so that's all I have. So it is almost 10 after, so I'm going to let my at home people go. Enjoy your day. Don't forget to look this back over. Please, please, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Olivia, if we start the quiz at the very beginning, you know, you may be able to get it going, but see, you know, pinch yourself, see what you think, and then just be in touch, okay? Okay, um, I'm starting it. It's today, right? What's that? When am I taking it? Next class. Oh, you Next class. Can, can be in, in that class at all? No. Okay, so how about this? You all just post it, just grab it, and do it during that day at some point, okay? Okay. I could also potentially do it today right now if you, that's okay. Um, yeah, I can do that. So let me give me a second. I'll post it for you, okay? Okay. Well, what I'll do is I will set it up on Google Classroom. I'll put your name on it. I'll just uh, only check you off, and it'll be there. Just go ahead and you can do that. And then this way, you don't need to worry about it. Then just check in when you can and see what the homework assignment was going to be for next class, OK? OK. I'll let, you, I'll let you go, and then I'll set this up. In a few minutes, you'll see it on Google Classroom. OK, thank you. Welcome, honey. Bye-bye.